if you have your Bible handy, whether it's an old-fashioned paper one or a fancy electronic one, if you would open it to John chapter 13, as Pete has already mentioned where we're looking today. It is the Last Supper. Jesus has washed the feet of those who are gathered with him as a humble servant. He's the guest of honor, but he is the one serving all the others. He has been teaching them of the things to come, pointing them to his Father. And then we get to verse 21 of John 13. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that it was because Judas had the money bag and Jesus was telling him to buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. Pray with me. Lord God, this passage weighs heavy because in it we are all reminded of our own times of turning against you or against those we care about. We're reminded of the times when we've been on the receiving end of betrayals. Lord, we pray that as we look at your word, that you would show us how to be like you, how to respond to the inevitable betrayals that come, how to do it in Christ-like fashion. We pray that you would continue to work in our hearts and in our lives as you promised to do, conforming us into your image, that we would be more and more like you we pray that your Holy Spirit would make your word alive and it would be your words that go forth this night. Your words of comfort, your words of teaching, your words of challenge, and that we would receive it as we need it. And that all of that would be for your glory and your honor and your praise. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Betrayal has an ugly ring to it, doesn't it? I mean, to hear somebody say, I was betrayed, there is so much pain that comes with that. And yet it is so common an experience in life. Betrayal happens all the time. And it just sticks with us. It sticks out. It just, it, it just glares into our lives. I mean, think about some of the great betrayals of history and how they just have stuck with us throughout time. You have Julius Caesar, who knows he has enemies. And as those enemies attack him on the steps of the Roman Senate, stabbing him to death, he turns and is stunned, shocked, to see his nephew, Marcus Brutus, raising a dagger against him. He never saw that coming. 
And so he utters those famous words, et tu, Brute. Even you, Brutus, my nephew, the one close to me. You know, that's part of what makes betrayal so hideous because anybody can hurt you, but only those close to you can betray you. And when they do, their names become just synonymous with betrayal because of the violation that it does of the relationship. Think in American history. I mean, who is the most famous betrayer in all of American history? I'm hearing it. Benedict Arnold. I mean, it's just, it's, his name is synonymous with betrayal because he betrayed his country by planning to turn over the, the plans of the fortification at West Point to the British. Now what most people don't realize is that Benedict Arnold was one of the closest confidants and most trusted generals of George Washington. He wasn't just any soldier. He was responsible for some of the most important victories early in the, the American Revolution. Without some of what he did, it would have been over before it really got started. But others took credit for his victories. And he, he just chewed on that. And the jealousy and the anger and the bitterness and resentment just started to set in. And over time, he laid out a plan to betray the very people that he had fought with and hand them over to the people they fought against. And he eventually becomes a major general in the British army that is still fighting his former compatriots. That's betrayal. And of course, the most infamous betrayal of all. What we just read about a few moments ago. The betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot. A betrayal that came from someone so close to him in such an intimate relationship that the betrayal actually happened with a kiss. And for the price of 30 pieces of silver. Being betrayed is so painful because it only comes at the hands of those you have trusted, who are close to you, who you love. That's what happened with Jesus and Judas. Jesus understood the pain of betrayal. He lived it. He knew it firsthand. When, when, when the Bible says that, that he experienced all things as we have, it includes that pain of betrayal of a friend. And it was painful. In verse 21, the very beginning of that passage, John says that Jesus was deeply troubled in his spirit. It's the same word that he uses to talk about Jesus agonizing over the death of Lazarus, whom he loved. Jesus knows what's coming. I mean, he has just announced, and he has announced a couple of times before that he knew this was coming. He knows the betrayal is coming, and, and the, even knowing it, and trying to prepare for it, it's still painful. He's got this troubled, deep anguish. He's feeling personal pain, he's feeling turmoil. Because he says, one of you, one of you at this very table, one whom I have spent three years with, giving of myself to you, one whose, whose very feet I just washed a few moments ago, one whom I am providing food and the intimacy of fellowship for, one of you is going to hand me over to the authorities. And that was code for get me executed. He knows it's not just that he's going to be betrayed to be put in jail. He knows he's going to be betrayed in order to be killed. One of them was going to stab him in the back by turning him over to his executioners. Now, this kind of betrayal, from someone close to us is not new even with Judas. It goes back to the beginning of all things just about. It goes back before the creation of human beings, before the creation of the world. It goes back to the time when God dwelt in this relationship with the heavenly host that he had created, with the angelic beings, and one who was close to him one who was near him in his throne room, 
betrayed him, rebelled against him, and led a third of the angelic host in rebellion against God. We get a hint of this in Isaiah chapter 14, in verses 12 to 19, where we hear about Lucifer, which literally means the morning star or the sun of the dawn, about, about this, this angelic being who is, who is close to God and has a relationship with God that, that is almost unique compared to the other angelic beings. But that's not enough for him. And Isaiah tells us that, that Lucifer, the son of the morning star, wanted to raise himself up above even God. And so he betrayed the position that God had created him for, betrayed the relationship, and leads the angelic host against the Lord. We get a little further explanation of it in Ezekiel chapter 28, where, where we are told that, that, that this son of the dawn, this morning star, was, was an anointed cherub, was, had this position of anointing of, and of power that God had given him as a guardian of some kind. But Ezekiel tells us that he became filled with corruption and became filled with unrighteousness and filled with a desire for himself and only himself. And so he leads this rebellion against God. Well, that Lucifer, that son of the dawn, we most often refer to as Satan, that very Satan who John tells us at the taking of that morsel finally enters into Judas. And that's been his plan and his tactic throughout history. Ever since rebelling against God and getting cast out from that, that angelic place, from that throne room of God, Satan has continually been about the task of trying to get people to betray God and to betray one another. He does it in the garden when he shows up as the serpent. And he starts to cast doubt into the minds of Adam and Eve about God, God who has made them in such a way that they have a, a close, intimate relationship with God. They walk with God in the cool of the day, we're told. They just they have this, this relationship with God. They can hang out with God anytime, be close to, speak with, face to face. And Satan starts to throw in these little doubts. Is it really that way? Does God really care about you? Does he really love you? No, he's just trying to keep you down. He's just trying to, to withhold things from you. You can be greater than this. Just do what you want. Think about you. Think about yourself. And so he gets them to betray that relationship with God. Throughout the Old Testament, the, one of the themes that runs through it is the people of God continually being called by God into relationship with him, where God is saying, I love you, I care about you, you're mine. And the people of God getting close to God, receiving all the great blessings from God's hand, and then slowly drifting away again, betraying that relationship with God and turning to other gods, to, to idols, to, to, to worship even of demons, and, and all the way to the point of the sacrificing of their children at times. And just, just breaking that relationship with God. And Satan is again trying to get betrayal to take place. And eventually we get to the point where the biblical narrative tells us that Judas also succumbs to that tempting to betray. Now we have no idea why Judas wanted to betray Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us. I mean, there's the 30 pieces of silver thing, so some people said, well, it's all about greed, but that seems to somehow have been almost an afterthought in the deal with the Pharisees. It, maybe it was greed, maybe it was, was some jealousy that he had because of feeling slighted in some way, maybe it was some uh, misguided religious zeal. I mean, we just don't know what happened. But what we do know is this, is that all along the way, Satan kept putting little kind of darts of temptation into the life of Judas. And eventually it took root, and he started to just kind of chew on it. And he got to the place where he decided, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go down that road. And he started to plan for that time when he would, in fact, betray Jesus. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that Satan uses betrayal as a favorite tactic. For this reason, two of them. First, love loyalty, sacrifice for others, putting the needs of others before yourself, those are things that are close to the heart of God. That's what Jesus was all about coming into the world. And betrayal is the exact opposite. Satan is the exact opposite of that. 
where Jesus says that we need to consider the needs of others. Satan says, think about yourself. You know, we've got this, we've got this phrase that, we, that we've been using around here a lot lately to talk about our mission together, where we say, I am, going off God's identification of himself to Moses, that I am God. You know, I am the great I am. We say that I am is us together for them there. So it's all about us being together with God, together with one another, for the sake of serving others. I am for us is us together for them there. What betrayal does is says this, I am for me wherever I happen to be. It completely breaks that whole idea of being for others. And that's what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to attack the very character of God, the very nature of God, which is giving which is serving others, which is loving others, which is being faithful to others through all things. Jesus saying, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's at his very heart and his character. And Satan hates that. And so he tries to use betrayal to even attack the character of God. But the second part of it is this. He uses betrayal simply because he's a liar. He's a liar. Jesus says this in, in John chapter 8, starting in verse 44. He's speaking to the religious leaders who have been hypocritically leading people astray, teaching them false things, thinking only about themselves. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand on the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and a father of lies. It's the exact opposite of Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And when he speaks, he speaks truth out of his own character. And Satan hates that, so he speaks lies because it's who he is. He's a liar. How do you know when Satan's lying? His lips are moving. I mean, that's, that's what Jesus is saying, because it's who he is. Well, how's that fit with betrayal? The greatest betrayals require the greatest liars. Think about what happened here with Judas. None of the other disciples had any clue what was going on. You know, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, none of them went, oh, that, you know, I'm thinking Judas. Because <laughs> I've been kind of wondering about him. He just doesn't seem right. That's not... What happens is, they all start going, is, is it me? Jesus, is it me? You know, which says something of them knowing their own doubts and insecurities inside. But the point is, none of them know. They're clueless. Even when Jesus sends Judas out, they don't realize what's going on. They think, oh, well, maybe he's going to buy some more food. Or maybe he's going to do the offering for the poor that is a part of the, the Passover tradition. I don't know. You know how good a deceiver you have to be to be in that close-knit a group for three years and never give any indication of your dissatisfaction with Jesus and what's going on? See, I think Satan loves betrayals because it requires a great liar. And betrayal requires that liar to continue to appear to be close to be supportive, to be encouraging, and then out of the blue, it comes. It requires that intimacy. At the Last Supper, we have that intimacy in all different kind of ways. You know, most of you, you're gonna be familiar with Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. I mean, you've, you've seen it, it's an iconic, classic work. Uh, and it's beautiful, I mean, it's good stuff. But here's the thing that we need to understand about that, that painting. It's not historically accurate. Uh, beautiful, you got all the disciples, you got Jesus, people have been trying to figure out which, who's who, you know, and they can place the different disciples based on what's happening. But they're seated at a medieval banquet table. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, first they're sitting on chairs, no. It's a table that's raised up, no. And it's a long banquet table, no. That's what Da Vinci knew. So, you know, cut him some slack. 
But that's not what the Last Supper looked like. Here's what the Last Supper really looked like as they were gathered around the table having a meal. It's a low table. You've got pillows that you're kind of reclining on. You lean on your left elbow and you eat with your right hand reaching into the bowls that are there. So you, you've got this sense of you're, you're kind of close to each other. Okay? You, you don't all have your space in your chair. You're kind of there lounging. Now, what you see in this picture, you see at the head of the table, there's three people. And this is how it would have been. Jesus is in the middle. He's in the center of those three. To the top of the picture, able to lean into Jesus' breast and whisper in his ear, is John, the writer of the gospel, the beloved disciple. Immediately next to Jesus, kind of behind him, is Judas. That's how close this is. This is what it would have looked like if you sat there seeing what's going on. There's John, you see, on, on your left, as you look at it, Jesus in the middle, handing the morsel of bread to Judas. Now, there's a couple of things to understand about this, what's going on here. By having the seating the way it is, Jesus, as, as the head of the banquet, as the one in charge of it all, has given the two seats of honor, one to John and one to Judas. Now, remember, he knows Judas is going to betray him, but he has given him a seat of honor on his left-hand side. And he has, he has already cleansed, washed Judas' feet. But it's so close here, it's so, it, it's so intimate that when, when John leans into Jesus to ask, who is it, nobody else hears the conversation. Even Judas, right next to Jesus, doesn't hear it. That's, it's right here. Jesus, who is it? The one I dip with, this bread. And at that point, Jesus takes some of the bread and dips. And actually what happened is they, he and Judas dipped together. It's like Jesus offers him the morsel and together they dip it and then he leaves it for Judas. In, in Ethiopian culture, you eat out of common bowls. Now you probably have family meals where you eat out of common bowls, but you have a nice big serving spoon. You put it on your plate, put it on somebody else's plate. No, no spoons. <laughs> you, know, you reach in and you grab meat, vegetables, whatever, and you eat. And everybody else is reaching into the same bowls. And you might use some bread to do that and kind of, kind of dip some, get a little extra meat there. But everybody's dipping in like that. Now, I never thought that I would hear double dip twice in one worship service at Northland, okay? You know, Pete mentioned it. You can double dip on the sermons. Well, here's, most of you freak out if somebody double dips a chip, right? Imagine it's so close, you're eat, you're here. And so the Ethiopians even have a word for that. It's called gorsha. And the word means the dipping as Jesus and Judas did. It's, a, it's an intimacy. So Jesus gives Judas this seat of honor, and then actually by dipping with him and giving him the bread, by feeding him, he's honoring him one last time. It's one last way of saying, Judas, I'm honoring you. I love you. I know what you're going to do. What's the deal? And so when Jesus says, do whatever you're going to do, Judas decides, okay, I, die is cast. I'm going. I'm out. I'm betraying him. Up until the very last moment, Jesus is honoring Judas. Here's what he's doing. He's doing what he's told us to do in Matthew chapter five. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. You know, Jesus was, he, he, there was anguish. There was, he was deeply troubled. I'm sure on one level, he didn't have a whole lot of warm fuzzies for Judas at the moment, but he loved him by action by honoring, by serving him. He says, that's what you do to the betrayer. That's how you respond to the inevitable betrayal. It's the same thing what Paul said in Romans chapter five. He said, God showed his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Jesus knew betrayal would come. He knew that it's part and parcel of dealing with sinful human beings. We are a fallen people. We have close relationships, yet in our sin, we do things to, to hurt those, to break those, to betray those relationships. And so Jesus gives us the example of how we respond to it. He says, you respond to it by loving just as I loved Judas. And not only Judas, because there are other betrayers of a fashion around that table. You know, Pastor Joel mentioned this morning, there's a couple of different kinds of betrayal. There is the, the opportunistic betrayal. That's what Judas is doing. He's looking for the opportunity. He's planning it. He's laying it out. You know, he's, he's got this scheme in mind. And that's a deep-seated betrayal. But then there's also uh, the, the momentary betrayal. You know, the, the moment when you kind of freak out, you're not sure, and you throw somebody else under the bus. Well, that's what happens with all the other disciples. They also betray Jesus in a fashion. And Jesus knows that's coming too. You know, he says to them, he says, you know, you're all going to abandon me or forsake me. And Peter says, not me. I, never, Lord, I'll never leave you. And Jesus looks right at him. Before the rooster crows in the morning, three times you're going to betray me. You'll deny you even know who I am. He's like, no, no way, it never happened. Jesus gets arrested, dragged off to the courtyard the, to Caiaphas for trial. They send him to Pilate as well. But there as he's in the courtyard and he's facing this trial, Peter makes his way into the courtyard. And he denies even knowing who Jesus is twice. And then on the third time, Luke, Luke tells us this. He's asked again, and finally Peter says, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And here's one of the most dramatic moments in all of history. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. They locked eyes across that courtyard. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Wow. But the story doesn't end there, does it? Jesus goes to the cross. He's buried in the tomb. Peter's got to be wrestling with his guilt like crazy. Hears that Jesus is, is risen and alive. It's, it's too good to be true. They eventually find out that it is true. They have some encounters with Jesus. Sometime later, you know, a couple of weeks later, they're sitting down, they're having breakfast. And Jesus looks at Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? And at the third question, Peter was grieved because the Lord asked him the third time. Because the last time somebody asked him the same question three times in a row, he denied that he even knew him. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. What did Jesus just do? He said, Peter, look, I know, I, know, I know you threw me under the bus. I know that in the moment you betrayed because you were scared. But I love you. And I know you've turned your heart back to me and that you love me. And I forgive you. And that's in the past. That's how Jesus deals with betrayal. He loves his enemies. He prays for them. He honors them by giving them the seat at the head of the table right next to him. He feeds them from his own hand and washes their feet. How do we respond to betrayal when it comes? Well, here's where the gospel shines through. Remember this when you are betrayed. Because I try to remember this when I'm betrayed. I'm Judas. And so are you. I'm Peter. And so are you. 
and I am Andrew and, and Nathaniel and Matthew and all the others that night who fled. And so are you. And so if Jesus comes back to me, like he came back to Simon Peter and said, do you love me? And he gives me a do-over. Who am I to hold it against those who either by design or in the moment betray me? I've got to forgive them in the same way. Now understand this also. Those who betray always lose if they don't repent. Judas lost for all eternity. Peter repented. George Washington was pain-stricken by what Benedict Arnold did. Benedict Arnold is forever a name synonymous with betrayal. He's lost. George Washington becomes the father of his nation. And on and on it goes. So when you're thinking, I want to get back at them, I want to somehow get even in all this, just know the best way to get back and get even <laughs> is to love and honor. Knowing that if they turn, you've restored a relationship. And if they don't, you have lived in a Christ-like way. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If Jesus died for me, who has betrayed him? Who am I to hold it against those who have betrayed me? Only with the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit can I do otherwise. And so can you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you've done for us what you did for Peter. You've honored us as you honored Judas. You said you've prayed for us. You said you've given your life for us. You're the master, we're the servants. Make us into a people who can take the pain of betrayal and redeem it for the glory of God and make it possible for people to know the love of Christ when it comes through us to them. And Lord, when we are the betrayer, give us the strength to own that and to turn back and seek forgiveness and to seek reconciliation and to be strengthened and empowered by you for your glory and for your honor. Amen. Amen. How you doing, bud? All right. We're going to have a short time for, for a couple of questions, if you might have those. Uh, and I have my lovely assistant <laughs> to help us out. Ivan just, you, you know, with the beard and the, and the head, it's like, it is so Ivan Koloff, you know. Some of you know that name, old wrestler guy. All right. So, take it over. Folks, as you know, um, we get time for questions and if you want to just raise your hands we have folks here and in, in with mics that will come to you um, folks online send your questions in we only have time for a few but uh, we'll get through some who's going to be the first brave soul all right well somebody's thinking I do have we one, got one down online front. oh one right here right front. Thank you. Um, I'm having trouble with the connection. This was all preordained. Mm -hmm. The betrayal that yeah. is a, an organic. I'm not sure how. how to, how's that all fit? Yes. Yeah. It, that's a great question. I mean, you, we look at it and we know that Jesus is going to go to the cross. He predicts that it's going to happen. He predicts that he's going to be betrayed. So there, there seems to be this preordained aspect to it. 
And if that's the case, is Judas just a robot? Is he really responsible? Was it really a betrayal? Or did he actually do what Jesus wanted him to do? You know, and there's even one scholar who's come out and said, oh, no, Judas was part of the plan and did exactly what Jesus wanted, and Ju Judas was a good guy. Well, here's, here's what we need to understand. God knows what's going to happen. He arranges history to get to that point. But yet, we still have responsibility for who we are and what we do. And in the case of Judas, we see this. He's been tempted all along the way. Satan's been, you know, giving him some temptations. And at some point, Judas has to take responsibility for the fact that he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give into it. Even the, the place where it says, and Satan entered into him, uh, Judas still had the ability, uh, if you will, to, and the responsibility to live by his own right or wrong choices. Now, we could play the whole thing out of, well, what would have happened then if he didn't betray Jesus? Would Jesus have still gone to the cross and all that sort of thing? That's speculation that gets us way outside where Scripture is. What we do know is Jesus was going to go to the cross, he was going to be betrayed, and Judas, of his own volition, said, I'm going to be a part of this, and I'm going to betray him. Um, it's like what happens with Pharaoh, uh, you know, it, where it says that, that, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. All it took for that to happen was for God to go, I'm going to stand back take my grace off of you and let things run the course that they will. And I think that's what you have with Judas. God just says, I'm going to step back. I could have kept, he could have kept Judas from doing something. But instead what he does is he says, I'm going to step back. And he lets Judas do what Judas naturally was inclined to do, knowing that it's going to happen that way. So it's not that God sort of marionetted Judas into making this thing happen. It's more that God said, I'm going to let you do what you naturally want to do and, and, and remove my, my boundaries from you. So it's Judas's responsibility then for what he carried out. But it is, it's a tough question to wrestle with, but it's one that we, we have to wrestle with. One more probably. We have time for one more question. And Mark, it's right down here. Section four will be our last question for tonight. Just remember, folks, as Mark's getting there, uh, if you think of a question throughout the week or right after service, send your question in. Ask a pastor at northlandchurch.net. You get your question answered. Last question. Hi, Pastor Dan. Hey, Tom. <clears throat> um, I have a dear friend who was betrayed in the worst way. And I hear you say for those who are betrayed to, to forgive and Mm -hmm. and give that person who betrayed them a, a chance to repent. Mm -hmm. My question is, what if that betrayal caused so much hurt and mistrust yeah. that they can't do that? Yeah. It, yeah, there are betrayals like that, you know, and, and if, if we were already Christ-like, we could do it, but, you know, we're, we're still hurt, broken, fallen people, and that makes it really tough. Um, because there is a certain amount of, of rebuilding trust, you know, and that, that takes a lot of time and, and effort and energy. Um, you, can't, you can't artificially force somebody into forgiveness and into trust because of all the pain that goes with it. Uh, and so I think one of the things that's necessary is a lot of patience, a lot of love, a lot of prayer, um, and, and a willingness sometimes, you know, sometimes when you're the one who has done the betraying, you want to just make every, like, just, okay, it didn't happen. You know, let's just forget about it. Let's, let's, you know, rewind the tape, replay it differently. And that's really hard for us to do as human beings. So the need to give someone all the time they need to get to a place where they can say, yeah, I, I do forgive. I'm ready to move on. Uh, because that's not naturally a part of who we are. So you, don't, you can't force it. And the more you try to force it, uh, the more you're going to mess it up. You know? So, all right. Thank you. Um, as we close, you know, one, uh, one thing I want to point out before the last couple quick announcements. Uh, you know, Pastor Joel mentioned last week uh, this I um, the idea about us being in community and, and investing in community with one another because we're really trying to change the world. We're trying to change lives. We're trying to change the community we live in and beyond that. Uh, when you look at the early church in Acts, 
uh, they really had three things going on that they, that they gave of themselves for one another, and that helped change the world. You know, they, as they gathered together, we're told that they regularly devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, to meeting regularly for worship in the temple. They served one another. Uh, they sold their possessions and gave to any who had needs so that nobody went without the basic necessities of life. And so what you see in the early church and what caused Christianity to just impact the world as nothing before or since was they gave of their time, their talent, and their treasure. You know, those three things really stick out for me. You know, they, they spent time together in the Word. They spent time together with one another. That's how you build community, and you do it serving one another and serving others. They gave of their abilities, their talents. You know, if somebody could do something for another, you know, some had gifts in different areas, and so they served, and, and you know, we give you that opportunity around here all the time. But they also gave of their treasure. They made sure that people who were in need had legitimate needs, that they cared for one another, because it's family. It's what family does. And they also invested in the taking of the gospel to other places. You know, and, and that's what's happening here. I mean, if you want, if you want a place, if, if you're concerned about your return on investment, like, so, you know, so what do I get for, for my investment in something around here? You know, Northland is a great place to see what you do change lives every day. People coming to faith in Christ, being healed, brokenness being restored, and happening here and around the world. You know, so I just want to encourage you, especially as we've come out of summer and we start heading into the last quarter of the year, continue to give of those three things, but especially want to say for those who are part of the Northland family, this is a family moment. If you're here as a guest, just, you know, sit back, you'll, you'll get out the door in a moment. But if you're part of the Northland family and, and, and committed to us together as community, then remember to give. Give financially to what God is doing uh, and do it as an act of worship. You know, that, that's so important in the early church and throughout the history of the Bible. People came together and as an act of worship, they said, God, here, this is you. I give this gift to you, God, to honor you. And so don't forget that as you're on your way out and as we head into the last quarter of the year uh, to, to make that a priority in terms of serving one another. All right, uh, first time visitors, uh, you can listen in again now. <laughs> Thanks for being here in, in your little worship guide you got. There's a card you can fill out. We'd love to be able to connect with you and serve you in any way. Way. On your way out the door, drop it in one of the, the offering boxes or hand it to somebody at one of the kiosks. Uh, hub focus. Uh, we said it's about the parking team, that if you're a person that likes to tell people where to go, well, I'm going to tell you where to go right now. Go to the hub, okay? You get a nice yellow vest to wear on Sunday morning. Some of you look great in yellow, you know, and you can just tell people, go here, go there. So be a part of the parking team. Prayer ministry, if you want to come to a relationship with Christ and start that off, if you need healing, if you're wrestling with your own betrayal or betraying of another, forgiveness, whatever it might be, there'll be folks up front here to pray with you and also online to pray with you. With that, let's stand and receive the benediction. Know that Jesus has said this, he will never leave you, he will never forsake you, and he is with you always, even to the end of the earth. So go out into the world now in the power of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and make a difference in the lives of the people around you for Christ. God bless. We'll see you next week.